So the now popular pastime of mail bashing has been taken to a whole new level in the state of Victoria. The Victorian government is now going to spend $22 million on a respectful relationships program, which we know by now means always and everywhere respecting women and completely and utterly disrespecting any type of masculinity that feminists disapprove of. From the article, Victorian students will be taught about male privilege and how masculinity encourages control and dominance over women as part of a mandatory new school subject aimed at combating family violence. The Victorian government will push ahead with the rollout of its 22 million Respectful Relationships Education Program, despite claims the program fails to consider the multiple and complex drivers of family violence, ignores male victims, and amounts to the brainwashing of children. Evidence has emerged the program risks alienating men by presenting all men as bad and all women as victims, a point highlighted in a report evaluating a pilot of the program in 19 schools last year. As part of its broader campaign against family violence, the Andrews government has released a series of new resources aimed at kindergarten through to year 12 classes designed to complement a whole-of-school approach to violence prevention. The Resilience, Rights and Respectful Relationships learning materials aim to encourage gender equity in relationships and challenge gender stereotypes, which are key drivers of violence against women it is claimed. Now that's a very important point. It is claimed that gender stereotypes and sexism in general are key drivers of violence against women. The problem is there's absolutely no evidence to back those claims. But of course, it's not like feminists to let facts and evidence get in the way of a good narrative. But even feminists in some of the most feminized countries on the face of the earth are starting to wake up to the charade behind the domestic violence narrative. Just a couple of months ago, Swedish politician Ava Solberg, proud feminist and chairman of the Moderate Women's Party, took issue with what she sees as her government's, quote, tired, gendered analysis, which argued that eradicating sexism was the solution to the problem of domestic violence. She explained her reasoning. We know through extensive practice and experience that attempts to solve the issue through this kind of analysis have failed. And they've failed precisely because violence is not, and never has been, a gender issue. Solberg challenged the government report's assumption that there was a guilty sex and an innocent one. Thanks to extensive research in the field, both at the national and international level, we now know with great certainty that this breakdown by sex is simply not true. She made reference to the world's largest research database on intimate partner violence, the Partner Abuse State of Knowledge Project, which summarizes more than 1,700 scientific papers on the topic. She concluded that her government's report was based on misinformation about family violence and that, contrary to the report's one-sided view of men as the only perpetrators, many children were experiencing a very different reality. We must recognize the fact that domestic violence in at least half of its occurrence is carried out by female perpetrators. Now before you rush to applaud Ava Solberg's magical conversion, just remember that serious academics have known these simple truths for decades. So Ms. Solberg is not going to get a pat on the back from me for taking off her ideological blinkers and recognizing the truth, especially since feminists like her have been the driving force behind the avalanche of misinformation on this topic. And just on that partner abuse state of knowledge project, what do they identify as risk factors for intimate partner violence? Well, they note, with few exceptions, intimate partner violence risk factors are the same for men and women. There is no mention of sexism or sexist stereotypes, And the main risk factors are demographic risk factors, such as younger age, low income, unemployment, minority group membership. And again, this evidence has been available in Australia for some time. As Mark Latham has pointed out time and time again, quote, The New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics show that domestic violence is geographically concentrated in underclass areas, 
For every domestic incident in a middle-class suburb, there are 10 in a public housing estate and 25 in a remote Indigenous community. The best solution to family violence is a new national war against poverty. But no, the Victorian government will continue to ignore the evidence and plough ahead with the war on masculinity. Back to the original article. While the program refers to gender-based violence, the overriding emphasis is on men being the perpetrators of violent acts. Proposed lessons will introduce students to the concept of privilege. Well, of course it will, which is described as automatic, unearned benefits bestowed upon dominant groups based on gender, sexuality, race, or socioeconomic class. Now, notice the definition, because it's very important not only because of who it targets, but who it intentionally excludes. Because if we're talking about unearned benefits, we would need to talk about every beneficiary of affirmative action programs, or as we label them here in Australia, positive discrimination, such as the Indigenous, such as women. But that's why you include the word dominant, because that way you can justify blatant discrimination against men by bestowing unearned benefits on non-dominant groups like women, like the indigenous. Being born a male, you have advantages, such as being overly represented in the public sphere. And this will be true whether you personally approve or think you're entitled to this privilege, states guidance for the Year 7 and 8 curriculum. Now, how is that an advantage to boys exactly? Can someone demonstrate to me the causal link between two-thirds of our politicians being male today, and that making it easier for boys to subsequently become politicians in the future. I'd like to see that link demonstrated. But again, if you're a feminist or a cultural Marxist, you don't have to supply evidence for what you believe. You just have to assert it. And given that being a politician is a full-time job, and that 65% of full-time workers in Australia are male... Why would you expect women to have higher representation than they do? If you want higher representation, ladies, get up off your ass and work for it, like everybody else. Instead of, as feminists consistently do, argue for quotas for women in politics based on no qualification other than having a vagina. Just another example of an automatic, unearned benefit. By years 11 and 12, students are asked to examine their privilege and ways that equity can be encouraged, such as catch-up programs, special benefits or entitlements for those who are not considered privileged, or in other words, white males. So, now that we've established that males, specifically white males, are privileged, we can justify socialist redistributionist policies to give automatic unearned benefits to females and minorities. And that is the neat little trick. Assert that males have privilege because that justifies giving actual unearned benefits to anyone that isn't a white male. That's how you shoehorn in your socialist agenda. An awareness of the existence of male privilege is critical in understanding why there is a need for feminist perspectives and education on gender at all. No, There is actually no need to take feminist perspectives into account, and you've proved it with this ridiculous social engineering program. It also introduces students to the term hegemonic masculinity, which is defined as the dominant form of masculinity in society that requires boys and men to be heterosexual, tough, athletic, and emotionless, and encourages the control and dominance of men over women. So obviously I spoke too soon. Further proof of the extent of nut jobbery in feminist thought. Notice there's no acknowledgement of the role of biology or of evolutionary psychology in shaping modern masculinity. But what do you expect from the pseudoscience of feminism? Now I wonder if they intend to address any of the positive elements of masculinity. You know, the toxic part that created Western civilization, for example. I expect not. Jeremy Samet, a senior research fellow at the Centre for Independent Studies, criticised the program, calling it taxpayer-funded indoctrination of children. The idea behind this program, that all men are latent abusers by nature of the discourse, is an idea that only cloistered feminist academics could love. 
Dr. Samet told The Australian. A lot of evidence suggests that child abuse, domestic violence, is a byproduct of social dysfunction, welfare, drugs, family breakdown. So if you were wondering are there any sane individuals left in academia in Australia, the answer is yes, there still are a few. I'm going to skip ahead here a little. Hannah Grant, a spokesman for Our Watch, which managed the pilot and carried out the evaluation, acknowledged there had been tension in some schools and statistics demonstrating the gendered nature of violence often prompted challenging discussion. Hmm, I wonder why. Feedback suggested that the whole school briefing had a varied impact within and across schools, she said. Well, isn't that a very intentionally vague way of admitting there are problems? Education Minister James Molino dismissed concerns over the program. We will not stand by while one woman in Australia is killed every week through domestic violence. It's astounding anyone could think teaching our kids about respect for other people is a bad thing. I agree. It is astounding the level of moral cowardice and disingenuous virtue signaling by our elected elites. Remember these faces, because these are the public faces of a hateful movement willing to sell out the next generation of young Australian men just for the crime of being born male so that these lying, hypocritical scumbags can remain in power. So in my next video, I'm going to suggest ways that we can push back against this movement and potentially make it a political liability to back the social engineering policies of far-left feminist whack jobs.